Uh, take your Bible, turn to Genesis 22. Before I start saying anything real important, uh, I'd like for y'all to pray for me. I have a regularly scheduled doctor's appointment tomorrow. Just my general practitioner. Uh, but I think it comes at a um, uh, pretty good time. I'm not going to say a whole lot right now. Uh, but just ask everybody to pray for me and, and my health situations. Pray for Lisa too. Um, she's got a couple things going on. And um, anytime, anytime something comes, goes on with her, you know, we automatically start thinking of cancer. And I don't like, I don't like to do that. That puts us both in a bad place. And we went through a rough time with that. And so anyway, pray for her. But um, the effects of some things that are going on with me, I can feel them right now. So me um, acting a little off is not just my normal being a, a little off. So just pray for me. Genesis chapter 22. We're going to look at the heritage of Abraham. It's not something that I've ever really given much thought to until I started studying it. Uh, but when you think about it, um, there's a lot there that is laid upon this chapter right here. And what God asked Abraham to do in this chapter was not only significant to Abraham, but to us as well. We are referred to in the Bible as the children of Abraham. We be sons of Abraham, we, which makes us Israel. It makes us Israel. Now, I do not believe in replacement theology, and I won't tolerate replacement theology. I won't do it. Um, and we had somebody uh, in the church several years ago that was trying to, that had gotten into replacement theology. And um, I, I told him, I said, don't pass that around this church. Don't do it. I'm just telling you now, don't do it. And when I told him that, he left. He hasn't, he hasn't been back since. Um, <clears throat> it, 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 as, and he told me that he wanted to meet with me. And I said, okay. He said, I've got some new revelations about who Israel is. And as soon as he said that, I just went, oh, no. And I knew, what, I knew where he was going before he even started talking, he came in my office and started talking and I knew where he was going before he even got there. And uh, so anyway, I, I don't believe in replacing Israel, but the idea is God made a promise to the people called Israel. And there are those who are Israel by birth who will be heirs of that promise, but not all everybody, not everybody who is of Israel is of Israel. That's not quite how the Bible puts it, but it's close enough for me tonight. Okay. Uh, but because you and I are, are grafted in by faith and actually have the word grafted into us, we are children unto Abraham ourselves because we have the faith of Abraham. We trust God. Now God had Abraham trust him in a most extreme way. 
But if you look through the Bible, God never asked anybody else before or after Abraham to offer up their son, their only son to God. God never did that again with anybody else. So it was an, an extreme thing, but there's a reason for it. So let's read in Genesis 22 what I have up on the screen, verses 9 through 14. And they came to the place which God had told him of. And Abraham built an altar there and laid the wood in order and bound Isaac his son and laid him on the altar upon the wood. And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here am I. And he said, lay not thine hand upon the lad. Neither. And, and, and let me make this point. Um, and I have it. I have it underlined there on the screen. He laid the wood in order. And bound Isaac, his son, and laid him on the altar upon the wood. Boom! Right at that point, Abraham was faithful. Huh? Oh, don't tell me. Well, we're going to start all over again. It's one of those days. Yeah, that's hooked up. A network error has occurred. Do what? Thank you. It's on there now, right? Yeah, that's what I want. So now we'll do that and that. Right? What I have underlined up on the screen... Laid him on the altar upon the wood. And as soon as he did that, he fulfilled exactly what God had said. Again, God never told Abraham to kill Isaac. Never once. That's the modern translations that tell that lie. I'll never forget, we took, uh, back when we did things with the denomination, we took our teens... Um, my girls, Alicia, you were, you were part of that. And, um, we had a, had a thing with the, the churches down South and I could see what the guy did. And I, I started noticing this. They carry a Bible, but they don't plan on using it because they have a page that they have stuck in their Bible of the notes that they're going to preach from, and they'll never turn to their Bible anywhere. They'll have a page of notes here, and they'll hold the Bible like this. And I was watching the guy. As soon as he started, I, I, I saw that page in there, and I'm going, yeah, we're in trouble already. And he said, I'll be using the NIV. And I said, oh, now we're in trouble. And, I, and I'm telling myself, are we coming back to one of these? That's strike two. And then when he read in, in the NIV, Abraham, I want you to sac there I want you to sacrifice your son. I was sitting next to a guy from our church that went down with us and I poked him and I said, did you hear that? I said, that ain't what the King James says. That's strike three. We never went back. We never went back to another youth function after that. It was done. It was over with. But that's what you're going to find in the modern translations. They all contradict. They all cause God to contradict himself. Or for Abraham to believe an angel over what God said. Because let's read it. Now that he's laid... Isaac, on the, on, the, on the altar, he has fulfilled what God said. He offered him. Verse 10, And Abraham stretched forth his hand and took the knife to slay his son. And the angel of the Lord, not God, an angel, 
called unto him out of heaven and said, Abraham, Abraham. And he said, here am I. And he said, lay not thine hand upon the lad, neither do thou anything unto him. For now I know that thou fearest God, seeing thou hast not withheld thy son, thine only son from me. So he knew now, and this, this is where it gets into in the book of James, where he's talking about faith without works is dead. Abraham, take now thy son, thine only son, to a place that I will show thee and offer him up. And Abraham says, God, sure, you know I'll do that. But that has to be proven, doesn't it? Faith without works or faith without being tested, faith without being tried is dead. How many people make promises to God all the time and never, never complete them? How many people in wartime make promises to God? God, get me out of this and I'll become a priest or I'll whatever. Okay, but faith and works, God or Abraham was showing his work, his faith by his works because he trusted God that God, even if he killed him, would resurrect Isaac. We know Abraham was thinking that. And so verse 13, and Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked and behold behind him a ram. Caught in a thicket. By the way, that ram is playing tonight, if I understand correctly. Is today the... Huh? The No Bengals? Yeah, the Bengals and the Rams in there. Okay. So, notice that we're not having a Super Bowl party here. Okay. Abraham lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold him, a ram caught in a thicket by his horns. And Abraham went and took the ram and offered him for a, up for a burnt offering in the stead of his son. And Abraham called the name of that place Jehovah Jireh. Now what, notice this. Remember what the number 22 means. It's a revelation. As it is said to this day in the mount of the Lord, it shall be what? Seen. In other words, this is the place in the Mount of the Lord where it is going to be revealed. This is the place of revelation right here, Mount Moriah. And so 2,000 years later or two days later, counting them the way God counts them, two days later in that spot, God revealed his only begotten son to the entire world as the savior of mankind so you understand now just how big a deal this thing is with abraham how important it is doctrinally how important it is prophetically it fulfills and and foretells prophecy and it's basically the basis of what our entire religion is based on there is really only one thing that our religion is and it is that God sent his only begotten son to die for our sins that's it there's a lots of doctrine and prophecies and ways to live in this book. But the essential core of this is, do you believe that or not? Do you believe that or not? Uh, now, the heritage of Abraham. Turn to Micah chapter 7. <clears throat> Micah chapter 7 verse 16. The nations shall see and be confounded at all their might. They shall lay their hand upon their mouth. Their ears shall be deaf. 
And they shall lick the dust like a serpent. They shall move out of their holes like worms of the earth. And they shall be afraid of the Lord our God and shall fear because of thee. Who is a God like unto thee that pardoneth iniquity? Remember what I said this morning. God is a merciful God. And people, when you get down on yourself, beating yourself up, when you start getting hard on yourself about how bad you are, when I start telling you how bad you are, remember that God is still a merciful God. And God will still forgive. And he says, who is a God like unto thee that pardoneth iniquity and passeth by the transgression of the remnant of his heritage? He retaineth not his anger forever because he delighteth in mercy. He will turn again. He will have compassion upon us. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Let me read this again. Verse 19. Let me read this again. He will turn again. He will have compassion upon us. Now, I want to ask a question. How many times will God forgive the same sin that you've committed before? Huh? 70 times? You said 70 times 7? Yeah, that's a good one. I would say as many times as you can handle the whooping. If you can handle the whooping 70 times, I would say by the time you get to 70 times, you already have said, okay, that's enough. I can't take no more whippings. Okay? But have you ever read a verse in the Bible anywhere where God limited his mercy to a person who truly repented. Truly repented. No. His mercy endureth forever. It's like what, I, what I've been telling you about Solomon. The promise that God made to David concerning Solomon is that my mercy will I not take from him as I took it from Saul. If he transgress, I'll chasten him with the rod and with the stripes of men. But my mercy will I not take from him. That means that in all the sins that Solomon committed, and there was a lot of them, a thousand, thousands of them, that God forgave him of every single one of them. Every one of them. Because Solomon repented. And God made a promise that his mercy was going to endure with him. Um, verse 19. He will turn again. He will have compassion upon us. He will have subdue our iniquities. And thou wilt cast all their sins into the depths of of the sea which is where the um, the necklace is from Titanic those of you who remember that okay um, thou wilt perform the truth to Jacob and the and the mercy to a listen to this thou wilt perform the truth to Jacob and the mercy to Abraham which thou hast sworn unto our fathers from the days of old now if you are a child of Abraham, it doesn't matter if it's by birth or by grafting in the mercy, God's mercy to Abraham will always abide in you. That's the heritage of those who call themselves the children of Abraham and are the called the children of Abraham by God himself. Then Matthew chapter 3, turn there. 
Oh, I like this one. Matthew chapter 3, verse 1. In those days came John the Baptist preaching in the wilderness of Judea and saying, Repent ye, for the kingdom of heaven is at hand. For this is he that was spoken of by the prophet Isaiah, saying, The voice of one crying in the wilderness, Prepare ye the way of the Lord, make his path straight. And the same John had his remnant of a raiment of camel's hair and a leathern girdle about his loins, and his meat was locusts and wild honey. Then went out to him Jerusalem and all Judea and all the region round about Jordan and were baptized of him in Jordan, confessing their sins. But when he saw many of the Pharisees and Sadducees come to his baptism, he said unto them, O generation of vipers, who hath warned you to flee from the wrath to come? Bring forth therefore fruits, meet for repentance. In other words, they, and this is why if you come, if you call me and ask me, Pastor, we're going to be in the area, will you baptize me? I'm not going to tell you yes until we talk. I do not want anybody led to believe that they can be baptized by me and automatically get a get out of hell free card. I'm very particular about that. That was that was instilled in me by my preacher Goff, Pastor Goff, who made it a point. You want me to baptize you? Then I'm going to I'm going to need to see the fruits of repentance in your life. I'm going to need to see that. Bring forth therefore fruits meet for repentance. And think not. Think not to say within yourselves. We have Abraham to our father. For I say unto you. Watch this. That God is able of these stones. To raise up children unto Abraham. And you know what I believe? I believe he's done just that. Peter said in 1 Peter chapter 2, we then as lively stones do build up the whole house of God. We are the stones that God raised up to be the children of Abraham. Somebody say amen. In other words, the Jews were coming there cocky and arrogant saying we're the children of Abraham. How, how can you preach this that the kingdom of heaven is in your baptism in minutes and you're talking about somebody to come that you haven't even named yet and yet we're children and sons unto Abraham we have the kingdom and John the Baptist is saying don't even be saying that you're sons of Abraham because God is able of these stones to raise up children unto Abraham and that is exactly what he did and he left Israel behind temporarily out of that kingdom Matthew 22, verse 23, the same day came to him the Sadducees, which say that there is no resurrection. Is there a resurrection? If there's not a resurrection, what are we doing here? Roy, if there's no resurrection, what have you got to live for? Nothing. Nothing. But you have more to live for now than you ever had. I sang a song, and I don't think I've, I think I've only sang it one time. It was after my granddaughter died. And it's, uh, I've got more to go to heaven for than I had yesterday. There's a golden street to walk upon. There's a bell I'm going to ring. There's a brand new angel in the choir and I'm going to hear her sing. There'll be a lot of friends awaiting when I walk through the gate and I've got more to go to heaven for than I had yesterday. Paul said in 1 Corinthians 15, if there be no resurrection, we of all men most miserable. Because we live in a hopeless, hopeless religion. That offers absolutely no afterlife whatsoever. If all there is, is this right here. Then I will give myself over to eat, drink, and be merry for tomorrow we may die. I mean, why not? If there's no resurrection. So watch this. 
So that the Sadducees, which say that there's no resurrection, asked him, saying, Master Moses said, If a man die having no children, his brother shall marry his wife, raise up seed unto his brother. Now there were with us seven brethren, and the first, when he had married a wife, deceased, and having no issue, left his wife unto his brother, likewise the second also, and the third unto the seventh. And at last of all, the woman died also. Therefore, in the resurrection, whose wife shall she be of the seven? For they all had her. Jesus answered, this must be some woman. <laughs> Seven men that married her and said, oh Lord, kill me now. <laughs> get, get rid of me now. And he said, but as touching the resurrection, this is verse 31. Have you not read that which was spoken unto you by God saying, I'm the God of Abraham and the God of Isaac and the God of Jacob. See, three is the number for resurrection. What day was Jesus resurrected on? Third day. Okay. Uh, and remember what day it was in Genesis 22. They had traveled two days and on the third day they lifted up their eyes and they looked and saw the place afar off. It was on the third day. So he said, I'm the God of Abraham, the God of Isaac, and the God of Jacob. God is not the God of the dead, but of the living. And when the multitude heard this, they were astonished at his doctrine. Because God knew that Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were not only going to be in the resurrection, their soul was already alive at that time. To be absent from the body is to be present with the Lord. But where were they during this time? Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Christ hasn't died yet. So where were they? Luke 16. It's exactly what I was going to say, Johnny. Luke 16, so I skipped a whole note here just to answer your question. Luke 16, 19. There was a certain rich man which was clothed in purple and in fine linen and fared sumptuously every day. And there was a certain beggar named Lazarus which was laid at his gate full of sores. Desiring to be fed with the crumbs which fell from the rich man's table. Moreover, the dogs, that's what you should name your dog, next dog, Matthew, moreover. Moreover, the dog. Moreover, the dogs came and licked his sores, and it came to pass that the beggar died and was carried by the angels into Abraham's bosom. So where was he carried to? According to... What I can see in Genesis 40, the typology of Genesis 40. You had the baker and the butler. The butler was like uh, Joseph. He was in prison, but he was going to be lifted out of prison and set to set to a happy life. The butler was in prison, was going to be taken out of prison and hung in front of everybody. And so the Bible, Peter talks in both books about Jesus preaching the gospel and preaching to those spirits beneath the earth. So I believe that Jesus, when he died on the cross, they took his body down, laid it in the tomb. But his soul now has departed it to beneath the earth. Because he said, as Jonas was in the whale's belly three days and three nights, so shall the Son of Man be in the heart of the earth. And where did Jonas say he was go where he where did Jonas say he was? In hell. He, he specifically said in hell in Jonah chapter 2. Okay? 
So we have the, the typology showing us a picture of what happened. Jesus spent those days preaching to two groups of people. One group was the group that had lived in unbelief and were there already being tortured. They were already in hell fire. They were already being consumed. They were already, the worms were already eating at them. They were already wanting a drop of water to cool their tongue. They were already being burnt. But then you had another group who were in a, and there was a, what divided them? According to Abraham, what divided the two groups? A great gulf. So you can call it the gulf of the underworld, the gulf of Mexico if you want to. But there on the other side is Abraham and Lazarus is in his bosom, which is a place of comfort. Normally, my wife goes to sleep every night laying her head on my chest. That is a place of comfort for both of us. She is my wife, I'm her husband, and that's how we end, usually end our day. So Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob were not in a place being tormented because these all died in faith. Does that make sense to everybody? So why would God torture them in burning fire and flames and everything else? He, he didn't. So when Lazarus died, he went there. When Isaac died, he went there. When Jacob died, he went there. Because all three died in faith. Uh, Hebrews 11 makes that clear to us. Sarah was there. David was there. Josiah the king was there. Solomon was there. They were all there. In a place of comfort. Waiting for Christ to set captivity free. God's good, isn't he? I read, there, you have to understand that for years, and I don't know if the man's even alive now or not. For years in the Free Will Baptist denomination, the, the preeminent Greek scholar was a man by the name of Dr. Robert Piccarilli. I used to think that was a funny name, like Piccaninny or something like that. Or pickle, pickle something, pickled something. But anyway, he, um, he wrote an article and put it in a Free Will Baptist magazine. And he said, because of my extensive studies in the Greek, I no longer believe that Jesus went to the lower parts of the earth after he died. And I'm reading this, John, and I'm just going, I'm mad. Okay, number one, I, I didn't, I never had a class under him. I went to the college that he was at at the time he was there. But I didn't have, I only went there one semester and I didn't have a class under him. But... He had the name amongst all of the elite of the Free Will Baptist. So whatever he said, man, that, that was it. Just go along with it. But he had come up with some dumb way of taking a Greek word and going, Shh. To make it say something it no longer said. 
And I'm just furious at this. I got so mad I tore, I ripped it up and tore it up and threw it in the trash. I, it just made me angry. That this guy refused the testimony of scripture and placed his own intellect as an authority over the word of God. That ain't right. By the way, he's the same guy who did the talk on why, uh, why the King James Bible is not perfect at a denominational meeting. And at that time, I was on his side and I went to listen to him. And I was going, yeah, go get him, Dr. Piccarilli. They called him Dr. Pick at the Bible College. And I was on his side at that time and I have repented of that a lot for having that attitude that he had on that day I look back now and I shake my head and I'm going Mike what were you thinking you knew better than that but anyway that's 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 what he did that's what's happened anyway um, let's go the 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 what I'm trying to the point I'm trying to make with this here in Luke 16 is that because of Abraham's task that he was asked to perform, because of the faith that he had, and the fact that he carried through with what God asked him to do, God named the entire place of comfort after him Abraham's bosom the other part of it he simply called hell fire a place of torment how did there, you look at everything the rich man said um Verse 23, and in hell he lift up his eyes, being in torments, and seeth Abraham afar off, and Lazarus in his bosom. And he cried, um, and said, Father Abraham, have mercy on me. Send Lazarus, that he may dip the tip of his finger in water, and cool my tongue, for I am tormented in this flame. See, the rich man looks across the gulf, and he sees that Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, David, Solomon, all of those people, Sarah, Re Rebecca, they're all there. And Lazarus is there. They're not in torment. And the whole place was named after Abraham. Because of the one thing that he did. That no one's been asked to do before. No one on this earth has been asked to do after. The thing that God actually did himself. That's why God named it. Abraham's bosom. And the next time your faith is tested. And tried and you're not sure whether or not you believe go read Genesis 22 and read the story of Abraham and then remember what that place was named after him Abraham's bosom go lay go lay your head in Abraham's bosom and find comfort there Let's bow our heads. Father, we ask your blessings on your word. Father, I may not have said everything right. I may not have spoken everything exactly perfect. I pray that your Holy Spirit would correct any error that I have made. And I pray, dear God, that your people, all of those that have listened, Father, would 
glean not from my words, but from your words. Bless your word. I find comfort in this book. And thank you for letting me be a child of Abraham. The greatest man of faith himself. Blessed be all of those who are children of Abraham. We pray this in Jesus' name and all of God's people said, Amen.